Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When you hear the term Sabbath or Shabbat, what comes into your mind? Do you understand, as we talked about last week, that from a biblical perspective, and Judaism certainly teaches this, that there's a relationship between the Sabbath and the kingdom of God. The more that you study and understand the Sabbath, the more that you'll understand the significance of the kingdom. Now, we're in a midst of our study of John chapter 5 and a great miracle that took place there. A miracle which has very significant implications. But before we turn to John chapter 5, I just want to give you support of, of this truth that I shared with you. That the more you understand the Sabbath, the more you'll understand the kingdom. What's the biblical basis for that? Well, one place is in the book of Colossians in chapter 2. There, around verses 16 and 17, Paul is teaching. And he says, don't judge people. And that means don't judge them for what they do or not do. Judgment belongs to God. That is that condemnation. He's not talking about evaluating people. And in that passage, we as believers, we have the freedom, we have the liberty to utilize Scripture for the kingdom's benefit and for our benefit. And what he says here is that things such as the Shabbat and the festivals, he says, these are shadow of things which are to come. I want to emphasize, if you have a Bible that says which were to come, they are purposely misleading you because the Scripture says which are to come in the biblical language. So through things such as Sabbath and the holidays, we can get a glimpse of the things that are coming. What is that? Well, if you read, most Christian commentators understand that that which is coming is the kingdom of God, the things of the kingdom. So Shabbat and the festivals and the other things that are mentioned there are all shadows of things which are coming. But that which casts a shadow, that which is the basis of these things, meaning that gives these things meaning is who? It says Messiah or Christ. So the more we understand about Shabbat, festivals, new moons, and even the dietary laws as it speaks of food and drink, all these things give us insight, understanding concerning the kingdom and the king himself because he's what gives the shadow. And sometimes the word shadow is speaking of as the, the, the anointing, the substance of these things in a practical sense. So why do I say that? Well, open up your Bible now to John chapter 5 and verse 10. There we've seen that at the pool of Bethesda or Bethesda, there's a man who has been sick for 38 years. He's been at that place, whether it's all 38 years or not, he's been there, the scripture says, a long time. And Yeshua heals him. See, he didn't get the healing how he thought. He thought, oh, if I'm going to be healed, it's going to be in those waters, those waters that are stirred by the angel. No. See, sometimes we focus so much on how we think God is going to move, how He's going to bless us, that when God has a different way, we miss out because we're too focused on our way rather than His way. He may have something different. Just because someone else, and there were a multitude of people who received healing at that pool, doesn't mean that God's going to heal everyone that way. And by the way, we're going to see that that day, the only person Yeshua healed was that one man. Why? Because miracles aren't given simply to those who need a miracle. All those people could have used the miracle. But what we find here is only that day this one man received it. So let's begin verse 10. Yeshua says to him in the previous verse, 
take up your pallet and walk. Well, according to the scripture, I'm speaking about the book of James, there is a a forbidden activity, many on Shabbat, but one is to bring things in and out of the city. Why? Commerce. We don't do business on Shabbat. So it says that it's forbidden, forbidden to carry in the book of Jeremiah, but it means specifically to carry things in and out, products, commerce on Shabbat. But the rabbi said it's forbidden in ever since to carry. You can't carry anything on the Sabbath day, but the exception is this, in one location, meaning we know that in your house you can carry things because you're not doing business, but you can't take things from one location to another. In Hebrew, it's forbidden to do that. Now, they simply, to be on the safe side, said you can't carry at all outside. And what did Yeshua tell this man? He says, rise up, take up your pallet, and walk. And there's an emphasis on this walking, this this new lifestyle that the word walking speaks to. So this was done on the Sabbath day, and notice what happens. Verse 10, for this was, that day was the Sabbath day, and therefore the, and your Bible might say, the Jews. Well, be careful, because this man's Jewish. All the people at that, that, those, that pool and those five uh, porticos, they were Jewish. Everyone in Jerusalem, Jewish. So this term, the Jews, isn't really the Jews meaning all of those who are descendants of Jacob. No. It's the term, the Judeans. And it's not even speaking to all those from the tribe of Judah or for the southern kingdom of Judah. No. We're speaking about those who are the leaders. The term Judeans, especially in the book of John, or Jews, as it's oftentimes translated, means those who are of the tradition of the elders, who follow that school of thinking. And remember what we said about those who follow in a strictly observant manner the tradition of the elders. They forsake the commandments of God. And it's only when we understand the commandments of God are we going to be wise and understand how God functions because He doesn't violate His law. And therefore, we'll understand what God's up to. The law is a great source of revelation. So in this passage, look again, we're in verse 10, middle of it. Therefore, the Judeans said to the one who had been healed, It is Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your your pallet, this little bed or cot that you were laying on. You are transgressing the Sabbath day in doing that. Now, let me ask you a question. You know, miracles are not just simply for the sake of healing. We've talked about, right? There was a multitude of sick people there, but only one got healed. So what we can glean is this. Miracles are for the purpose of revelation. Messiah did things to confirm truth. It's not an accident. In fact, it's said over and over, rise, lift up your pallet, and walk. And the emphasis on lifting up your pallet and walking. The rising was the miracle. The lifting up your pallet and walking was the purpose of that miracle. So it's very interesting that uh, the Judeans, these leaders, they were there witnessing what was going on in Bethesda. They weren't, you know, having an order to it. You would think they would say, now listen, we want to be fair here. You know, one of the fairest things is first hear, first serve. Let's make a line. Let's not have just just a a helter-skelter expression where whoever gets in first and everyone jumps in and it's all disorderly. No. Let's bring some order of this. Let's not have like this gentleman who was here a long, long time. He gets no healing and someone else comes and here, here, he's here for a short period of time and he gets healing. But there was no order. They weren't interested in Bethesda. Why? Because they weren't interested in what God was up to. They weren't responding to where God was moving because they were all about their thoughts. But when someone violates their teaching, their understanding of the Sabbath, where are they immediately? They pounce on that individual. That's the context that we're seeing here. So once again, 
they say at the end of verse, verse 10, it is not lawful for you to lift up your pallet. And, and the one who had been healed, he said, the one who done this to me, made healing, that one had said to me, here's the second time, or the third literally, take up your pallet and walk. So now he puts it on Yeshua. He says, well, you know, I'm only doing the thing that the one who healed me. Now, this is important. Why? Because a healing is taking place. And more often than not, when one is healed, it is what? It is a sign of godly activity. See, these leaders should have said, well, well, you were healed. What, what, what was your problem? Well, the fact that he had pallet, he was paralyzed. And one of the prophetic signs, and don't miss this, one of the prophetic signs of Messiah is that he is going to cause the lame to leap and praise God. So, in this passage of Scripture, we find one who was lame is now walking, a prophetic indicator of Messiah. But uh, these leaders, they, they never pick up on that truth. They never understand what's going on in this passage. So this one answered them, the one who healed me, that one said to me, take up your pallet and walk. Therefore, verse 12, they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your pallet and walk. Do you see? Over and over, this is being emphasized in the text, not by chance. It is to emphasize, to tell the reader, this is important. Why? Because of a different understanding of the laws of Shabbat. One that comes from the Judeans who follow the tradition of the elders and one that comes from God. Here again, the beauty of this passage is this. Today in Judaism, there are prayers that we say specifically on the Sabbath day, tefillot lecholim. And our prayer is this, that God, that He would heal them even on the Sabbath day. Now, unless there's a matter of life and death, physicians don't practice medicine on the Sabbath day. Unless someone is in great pain, unless it's an absolute necessary necessity, you wait until Shabbat is over. But God, He can heal whenever. Now, do you think it's an accident? What is the significance that Messiah's miracles of healing, almost without exception, when it told what day they're on, they're on the Sabbath day. Why? Well, as God heals on the Sabbath day and we pray, so does Messiah. Why? To show us who He is, His identity, that He is God with us. So once again, the man says, the one who healed me, he said to me, take up your, my pallet and walk. And they say, oh, who is this man that told you to take up your pallet and walk? But the one, verse 13, but the one who was healed, he did not know who he was. And circle that word, no. Why? Well, a couple weeks ago, we talked about a unique grammatical construction. It is the pluperfect. And do you remember what the pluperfect speaks of? The pluperfect speaks about a remote condition, that is, something which is far away. And this man who was healed, his understanding of Messiah, his understanding of who this one was that healed him, he was far away from understanding the truth of this one's identity, that is, that he's the Messiah. So that's why it says in verse 13 in the middle, it says, but the one who was healed, he did not know who he is. For Yeshua, he had uh, left, departed uh, because of the crowd being in that place. Then you can imagine, Yeshua, all these people are there, probably some for a long time as well. And Yeshua just says, uh, uh, you want to be healed? Get up and you're healed. You can imagine everyone's hand, right? Heal me, heal me, heal me, solve my problem, help me. But Yeshua, He didn't do that. It says that He, he departed from that place. And what else do we see here? Well, notice, very important. Yeshua had left because of that crowd, verse 14. And afterwards, Yeshua found Him where? In the temple. Now, this is where it gets very interesting in the scripture. 
because let's go back and put the context. Last week when we open up this, this account from John chapter 5, we said that Yeshua was in Jerusalem. Usually at this time he wasn't there. He was in the north, in the Galilee area. There he was teaching. There he was healing. There he was revealing the truth that the light had come into the world as Isaiah prophesied. But now he was in Jerusalem. Why? Well, the answer is very simple. Because of a festival. And a festival required every Jewish male, these, one of these three festivals, every Jewish male to go up to Jerusalem and to make a sacrifice. Remember, don't appear before the Lord empty-handed. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is this. If Yeshua is an obedient Jew and he goes up to Jerusalem during a festival, where is his sacrifice? Well, this is what we're going to answer. Why? Remember the context. The context is Yeshua goes up to Jerusalem and where does he go? Well, he's right there by the sheep. See, everyone that came up to Jerusalem, by and large, they would arrive and they would go to the sheep. But Yeshua, he did something a little bit different. He goes to the sheep, but he doesn't stop there. He goes to Bethesda, the house of loving kindness, of mercy, of grace. Those people who were there because they wanted to be where God was moving. They wanted to be restored. And Yeshua, what does he do? Well, everyone else would go to the sheep and they would select one. There was a great significance in selecting your sheep. So people would do that. They would spend hours looking for the offering that they wanted to give to God. What did Yeshua do? He goes through Bethesda. All these multitudes of people, and he comes to this man. And what does he want to do? Well, it's the festival. You have to present an offering to God. This is his man's, this is Yeshua's offering. But the problem is, this man was, was incomplete. He lacked. He was, was what? He had a spot or a moon. He couldn't walk. So what did Yeshua do? He doesn't say, oh, this sheep is inadequate. So I reject him. I'll look for the next. No, because you know what? We're all inadequate. We're all spotted. We all have problems that disqualify us before God. And the only way that the Messiah can present someone to his heavenly Father as an offering is why? Because he heals that person. He heals us. And that's what he does. He's basically saying, do you want to be my offering? And why do we see that? Well, see, the question that we should be asking ourselves is this. It says in John chapter 5, verse 1, it was a festival of the Jewish people. Jesus is Jewish. He goes up to Jerusalem to observe this. The question we should be asking is, where's his sacrifice? Where's his offering? And the answer is, this man. And that's why it's so significant. Look at the scripture, verse 14. And after these things, Yeshua found him in the temple. See, through Yeshua's healing, this man was able to do something he couldn't do for 38 years, and that was what? Worship God in the temple. Approach Him. Yeshua restored him. That was his offering. So he found him in the temple, and he said to him, Behold, you have been healed. Now, now circle that phrase. Behold. Remember that word, behold? Whenever that word appears, it's to tell us something important is going to be said or happen in the biblical text. And if you look here, it says, Behold, healing he has become, or in this case, you have become. What's important is the construction. Here again, the biblical language conveys things that, that in English or in some other language, it can't be related. Because this word for, for becoming healed well, it's two words, and the word for being is in the perfect. Why is that important? Because his healing is not just for today, it's just not for tomorrow, but it's ongoing. Now, what is this teaching us about? It's teaching us about a kingdom quality that comes upon us. And it's not supposed to be temporary. It's supposed to be ongoing. It's supposed to be eternal. So Yeshua says to him, and this has great theological significance. Why? Well, if we want to be healed, and for us, sometimes that healing is physical. 
I may not need a physical healing right now. My body might be functioning okay, but I can tell you what, everyone who is born into this world needs a spiritual healing. That is, they need the forgiveness of sin. They need to be saved. And incumbent upon that is a desire, what? To turn away from sin. If you say, yes, I want to be saved. I want to be given for my sins. I want to be in the kingdom of heaven when I die. But in the meantime, I want to walk in sin. No, Yeshua is saying this. He says to him, Behold, you have become healed. That is an ongoing process. Not the healing, but the outcome of that healing. He says, No longer you shall sin, in order that something worse does not come upon you. So Yeshua is saying here something very important. You have been physically healed. And now through the truth of this passage, you have revealed, you have had revealed to you a very important principle that you're not supposed to what? Live in sin. Now, what has been said over and over in this passage? He says, walk how? He says, carry your pallet and walk. Now, the religious leaders, they thought he was violating the Shabbat. He was not because there's no problem in doing it. The, uh, the prohibition is doing commerce, carrying things in and out of Jerusalem for the purpose of business, selling things on Shabbat. But Yeshua knew that this would be what? That this would cause attention from the Pharisees, the Judeans. And the point he wanted to make was this. Why are you emphasizing a man-made interpretation of the law? What you think Shabbat is about, remember, Shabbat is the kingdom. There's a relationship between them spiritually, hermeneutically in the passage of, of God's Word. So they were wrong in their understanding of Shabbat. They were wrong in their understanding of the kingdom. They didn't see the significance of what was happening here. So Yeshua says, no longer sin in order that something worse should come upon you. And the man left, and here's what I like. I mean, you can imagine that these Pharisees, these, these rabbinical leaders, they were angry at this, this, this man. He says, you know, I'm only doing what the one who healed me did. And what did he do? Well, here's a boldness. You see, in this passage of Scripture, immediately when he found out it was Yeshua, what did he do? It says, the man departed, that is, he left Yeshua, and he proclaimed a great word. It's that word to proclaim, to evangelize in one sense, but it's simply the word proclaim. He proclaimed to these leaders, to the Jews, but here again, not all the Jewish people, to the religious leaders, that Yeshua is the one who, who made him whole. And on account of this, verse 16, on account of this, they were persecuting Yeshua, who? The Jewish people? No, not the Jewish people, the leadership and they were seeking to put him to death. Why? Well, here's the problem. He did a good thing, but it was not in keeping with their understanding. And notice what they wanted to do. Instead of sitting down with Yeshua and having a theological discussion, hearing the truth, being led to understand what God was up to, what did they want to do? They wanted to do what was not lawful according to the Torah. But according to their tradition, it was. So what did they want to do? They wanted to, they sought to put him to death. And, and these things, what? Because these things he did on the Sabbath. But Yeshua answered them, and notice what he said. He knew their, their, their intent. He knew what they were about. And notice what Yeshua does. Now, remember something very important. This miracle happened on what day? The answer is the Sabbath day. And it was not a chance happening that it took place on the Sabbath day. It was the providential expression of God's will that it happened on the Sabbath day. Why? Well, remember what I said to you. I said to you that miracles in the Scripture don't happen simply because someone is in need. There were numerous people, right, back in John 5 that needed a miracle. No. The reason why miracles take place is to reveal spiritual truth for the purpose of revelation. 
And when we look here, it's not by chance that all these things, what was done, was done on the Sabbath day. And Yeshua, to reveal His identity, notice what He says, but Yeshua answered them. He says, my Father, very important. Not just simply, I believe in God, Father God, no. He says it emphatically, my Father, until now, is working, and also I work. What He's revealing is this. What he did on that Sabbath day was a continuation of the work of God. And they understood that in a very clear sense, and they weren't willing to receive it. On account of this, therefore, all the more, it says, they were seeking, who? The Judeans. They were seeking to put him to death, to kill him. Why? Because not only in their view did he transgress Shabbat. Now, it's a play on words. Your Bible might say transgress, but it's the Greek word luo. Luo can be to set free. What Yeshua did was he set free the Sabbath. He gave a godly interpretation, a godly understanding of the Sabbath. He set it free from the pharisaical understanding of it, which made it a burden instead of a joy and a source of restoration. Now, they wanted to kill him all the more. Why? Because uh, the law demanded it? Because they were justified? No. Because they were undermining their teaching. It says, on account that he set free the Sabbath from their understanding, and also something in addition, because he said God was his own father. What was the implication of that? They knew it that he made himself equal to God. And it was that they could not understand and could not accept because they did not want to have any authority. Their belief as Pharisees was this. They believed that God created the heavens and the earth and that God was still active, not like the Sadducees believed that God had totally left. He looked but did not uh, interact with man. No, the Pharisees believed in angels. They believed in God's presence there, but that He would do so only under the authority of the Sanhedrin, that the Sanhedrin would bind and it would be bound, and what they said would be what God would do. In other words, their theology put them in control and God was their servant. And when their control was being challenged, they could not accept that. Well, let me ask you, can you accept when your control of your life is being challenged, or are you willing to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit? I'll leave you with that question until next week. May God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.